When it gets to politics, we all get a little weird. And by we, I don't just mean us in this room. I mean people across the globe. So let me rephrase. When it gets to politics, no matter who we are and no matter where we live, we all just get a little weird. How so? When we make political decisions, we just cannot seem to follow our material self-interest. We just don't. We just won't. Very often, we make political decisions that don't just disregard our self-interest, but directly oppose it. Let's do the test. Do you know somebody who's rather wealthy and votes progressive? And do you know somebody who's rather poor and votes conservative? Well, both these people vote in direct opposition to their own material gain. Let's call them your friends Dan and Joe. Your wealthy friend, Dan, by voting progressive, votes money right out of his pockets. Because let's be honest, Progressives are not exactly known for tax cuts. Your poor friend, let's call him Joe, by voting conservative, votes money out of the public infrastructure that he depends on. Because again, let's be honest, conservatives are not exactly known for pouring money into the public welfare system. So as I said, when it comes to politics, we all get a little weird. We just cannot seem to follow our self-interest. Now, when you want to find out what people truly care about, because clearly we all seem to have a hard time keeping our eyes on any one specific material price, if you want to find out what people truly care in politic, about in politics, where do you go? What do you look at? You look at the mind. You go to the mind, and when you get there, what do you do? You dig really, really deep. You unveil the hidden structures of the mind. You are, in essence, being a mind archaeologist. And you look at the structures that are just not obvious. And by doing that, you can get an increasingly clear answer to the question of how come that some of us are progressive against our material self-interest very often? How come some of us are conservative and yet others are torn? Because, by the way, what the heck is going on with the political middle? How come that those folks just simply cannot seem to make up their mind about what it is they want? in politics, and how can we move them? In order to understand these deeper layers of the mind, you unearth the non-obvious, the non-obvious structures of our cognition. And there is something that is not obvious about the way we reason about the world that we need to know about if we want to understand better what's going on with these political choices. And that is that your brain, my brain, everybody's brain loves concrete world experience, loves to think about the world in terms of things that we have experienced in our life, things we can see, things we can touch, things we can smell, things we can hear. Our brain loves that stuff. What our brain doesn't love so much is abstract ideas, such as politics. Because politics cannot be easily touched, seen, heard, smelled, any of those things. So that is a fundamental truth about the way that our brains work. Our brains want to think about the abstract in terms of the concrete. Taking this fundamental truth about the brain into account, my colleague George Lakoff, in 1996, came up with a revolutionary approach to understanding what conservatives really want. 
what progressives really want, why the middle just cannot seem to, to decide what they really want. And what he said is this, look, if our brain likes to think about the world, the abstract political world, in terms of concrete stuff, where do you think it turns? What is that most concrete experience we all have with being part of an in-group and having authority? It's the family. So what he found is that very commonly, automatically, implicitly, we cognize political realities in terms of family life. And so he said, well, maybe what conservatives really care about is strict family values, strict, tough love parenting. And maybe what moves progressives is nurturant, empathic family values. And maybe the middle just cannot decide because they cannot make up their mind what they want, not just in politics, but in parenting. For the past 10 years, for the past decade, um, I've been fascinated with these questions, and together with my lovely colleague, George Lakoff, and my equally lovely colleague, Matt Feinberg, have run a series of over two dozen studies looking into exactly these questions. Essentially taking the idea I just laid out and digging deeper and deeper and deeper into different aspects of it. And here's three things we asked in specific. Question one, is it true that we implicitly map our family values onto politics? Question two, are our family values a better indicator of our political behavior than our material interest? And question three, what the heck moves the middle? And how can we persuade them in elections? As you know, that's a hot topic across the world in politics because everybody wants to persuade the middle. Or at least understand what they, you know, where they come from. So, in a first study, we tackled this problem. And imagine for a moment you're one of our participants in this study. What we do is we tell you, look, congratulations, you've just become a parent, you have a baby boy. Let's name him Albert. And Albert has been crying all night. And he checked numerous times, and there's nothing wrong with him. Albert is just crying because he's crying. Now we give you two options to choose from. Option number one, you pick Albert up and you soothe him. Option number two, you let Albert cry himself to sleep. Think for a moment about what your answer would be to that question. Option A is nurturing parenting. You focus on empathy and compassion. You want to let Albert know that he's not alone in this world. Option B is strict parenting. You focus on self-reliance. Albert needs to toughen up. After we gave you these options, we, well, if you had been in our experiment, would have given you an opinion poll on politics, something that is seemingly entirely unrelated, asking you about the environment, taxation, the economy, and so on. What do you think would have happened? Well, here is what did happen. People polarized politically. The moment we got them to deeply think about their family values, they actually changed their political values. Well, they increased their political stances. Study number two. Remember, the question was, if not material interest, then what moves people in politics and do strict values in family life predict conservatism? Do nurturing values predict progressivism? And are people in the middle just torn in terms of what they believe is ideal parenting? In other words, if Dan and Joe, your wealthy and your poor friend, do not vote their self-interest, can we understand 
what moves them politically by asking them about how they would run a family. Maybe that's the type of opinion polls we need to do if we really want to know what people are up to politically. Stop asking for material interests and start asking for family values. And here's the study we did. We gave people statements about parenting and they had to indicate their agreement. Statements like, tough love is required to raise a child right. Straight. Or, children have to learn to see the world through other people's eyes. Nurturant. And then we looked at how people with strict and nurturant values positioned themselves politically. And what we saw is exactly what we predicted. Strict family values translated into conservatism, nurturing family values translated into progressivism, and then people who just couldn't decide in terms of political positions were also morally torn between family ideals. On to the third question, which actually relates to the point I was just making. If people in the middle are torn in terms of their family values, then there might be an opportunity to move them politically by doing what? Not addressing their material interests. We're going to lower your taxes, we're going to give you better schools, etc. But by appealing to their family values. And that is exactly what we tackled in study three. Study three, we wanted to find out whether or not people would move based on material gain and or whether they would move based on moral argumentation. To do this, we turn to the 2016 US presidential elections and we took people and asked them about their support for Donald Trump as a candidate. And then, of course, we asked them about family values. Were they strict? Were they nurturant? Were they torn? And what we saw, and this shouldn't come as a surprise at this point, is that people that supported Trump had strict family values. And people who opposed him had rather nurturant family values. And then folks in the middle that still hadn't quite decided what they wanted to do in the election endorsed both types of parenting. They said, I can go either way. I can be a strict parent, punishment is important, and I can be a nurturing parent. You know, I'll always go the extra mile and talk to my child about, about why something is wrong. But I told you the study wasn't primarily about testing again whether these values predict political positioning. What we really wanted to know is how can we move these people toward Trump. So we gave them wonderful statements by supposed experts, independent experts, who had studied the political scenery and were now ready to tell them, look, if you vote for Trump, the economy in America is going to go through the roof. What do you think? Did they move? You're still not convinced. That's okay, it's a ve I mean, if you think about the way that we think about politics, that we talk about politics, the way that campaigns are run, where you have issue silos and you try to address people's interests, women, the poor, the single mothers, the what, you know, whatever you have. Um, it's just not a way that we're used to think when it comes to politics. So, no, they did not move toward Trump, is the short answer. Well, then we gave them a moral argument and we said, look, experts have found out that Trump is exactly the strict father that our nation re needs right now. And they just scrambled toward Trump. They said, oh, well, they didn't say this consciously, their unconscious mind said, whoa, this is great. I just found my moral match. I just found somebody who's going to run this nation the way that I would run a family. And that's great. And that is where the political decision came from in that moment. So in these three studies, we tackled the question of how do people become conservative 
or progressive, and why some of us are in the middle, why some of us are ideologically flexible, or in other words, open to suggestions from either side. Now, I started this talk out by saying that when it comes to politics, we all get a little weird, because we cannot seem to follow our self-interest. Well, the truth is that when you look at the unconscious mind, if you look at the brain and the way it makes political decisions, we're the opposite of weird. We make decisions in a very principled way based on our family values, based on something that we deeply, deeply care about. And what does that mean for political conversation? Well, once you understand that your political opponent is doing nothing but following their values, is trying to do what they truly, honestly believe is best for the nation, you may be able to have more empathy and respect and form better coalitions. And also, once you get more clarity about your own values that underlie your political stances, you will have a much easier time arguing for what you want, forming coalitions and working across party lines and seeing that your true opinions, your tr true political goals, based on your morality, not based on self-interest, are being understood and taken care of. Thank you. Thank you.